Okay, the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. If you find the book of Psalms, you'll need to turn right, and it's about halfway between Psalms and Matthew. Book of Ezekiel. There are two great prophecies about the devil. He's mentioned in other places in the Old Testament. Two great passages telling about some things about the devil's past and the devil's future in the Old Testament. We're going to look at one of them uh, tonight. It's addressed to the king of Tyrus. But there are some things that are said in the passage that we're going to look at that look like that they are directed through the king of Tyrus to the one who was working through the king of Tyrus at the time. And that was uh, our old adversary, our old foe, uh, the dead. And so if you found the book of Ezekiel, would you turn please to chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. And there we'll read beginning with verse number 11. Ezekiel chapter 28. Would you stand with me now, please, in reverence for the reading of the Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 28 will begin at verse number 11. And we'll go down through verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse number 11. The Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man. I do want to remind you, while, and I realize that we're standing, but I do want to remind you that because that you find this designation throughout the book of Ezekiel, I'd like to encourage you to think more about the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Ezekiel than you might otherwise do, okay? Uh, because Jesus is called the Son of Man repeatedly, especially in the book of Matthew. All right, verse 12. Son of Man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy cover, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was presented in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour, devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. If you will please, I'd like you to Take your Bibles and look at, at one more verse. And we're actually going to use that as our text verse, although we've not read it yet. In that chapter, would you go back, please, to verse 2 in Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, verse 2, 
Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, you people who know your Bibles about the tribulation and Antichrist know what I'm talking about here when I read this. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. We'll use that for our text. Let's look at it one more time. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings upon us. In uh, these perilous times in which we live, we are so grateful for the peace of God that passeth all understanding. We are so grateful for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. We are grateful for your abiding presence for your guidance, and we're thankful for the assembly of God's people. I thank you for New Testament, local, Bible-believing, fundamental, independent Baptist churches such as this one. I pray for churches and pastors across the world that you would help them in these days to shine brightly for the Lord Jesus Christ. Please move in this service tonight. Use this message for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Be seated, please. In going through the Bible, reading it from front to back, I look for things that will be a blessing to me as well as for instruction. I sent a note to several people this morning. As I just read a verse in the book of Chronicles that was an encouragement to me. And I thought maybe I'd send a note out to, to tell you that let's read the Bible, let's pray, and let's encourage ourselves in the Lord. And when you go through the Bible from front to back, and I would like to encourage every last one of you to consider that as a habit. It's a habit that Mrs. O'Neill and I have that we plan to maintain until the day we die or the day we can no longer see to read. And then we'll just have to get somebody to read it to us like the late Alexander Scorby or somebody like that. There, By the way, there's a difference between you reading it and somebody else reading it. You're not reading the Bible if Alexander Scorby is reading the Bible and you're just listening to it. There are two different things. But in going through the Bible from front to back, I hope that you get a blessing and, uh, and not just read that Old Testament and say, I don't understand the thing I'm reading. Yeah. Come on, any of you struggle as you go through parts of the Old Testament? <laughs> what did I just read? But I pray that God will give you things from time to time where you say, praise God, I'm glad I'm saved, I'm glad I know the Lord. Look at there, there's something for me to, to learn from. Now, in uh, looking at this passage in Ezekiel, I want to speak of the great controversy. That was the title of a book that, uh, that the late Ellen G. White, founder of the Seventh-day Adventist, wrote about uh, the Lord and the devil. And I want to talk to you some. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not even close to being Seventh-day Adventist, okay? I'm probably closer to being a Catholic than I am Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> And you know I'm not very close to being a Catholic. But the most Catholic thing about me is my last name, O'Neill. And I am a dad, so you could call me Father O'Neill. I wouldn't recommend it, but, but that's about as close I'll get to being a Catholic. But I want to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the, the relationship with uh, the devil. I want to title tonight's message because... Ezekiel is called repeatedly in the book of Ezekiel, the Son of Man. The Lord Jesus Christ is called repeatedly, especially in the book of Matthew, the Son of Man. So I want you to keep Jesus in mind, uh, even more so as you read through the book of Ezekiel. But we see some things here uh, about uh, the devil and our Lord. On the title, tonight's message, Jesus, the Son of Man, 
and Satan, the man of sin. Jesus, the son of man, and Satan, the man of sin. Now, both of those titles have to do with their earthly manifestations, and the devil will be manifest in human form, it looks like, toward the second half of the tribulation period, where he will literally inhabit uh, the form of a human being, uh, the Antichrist, after a, a deadly blow by a sword. And folks, don't you uh, doubt that there will still be swords in use by the time of the second coming. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but there are people who use swords today. As a matter of fact, there are Christians who are being beheaded by swords today, by blades uh, today. And so the Antichrist is going to be revealed uh, as, uh, as someone just like the king of Tyrus here in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 because he is going to sit in the seat of God midway through the tribulation period. And I'll bring out the chart. But midway through the tribulation period, the, uh, the Antichrist, having just recovered miraculously from a mortal wound upon his uh, right side, upon his right eye, from his arm and his right eye, he's going to recover from this deadly wound. All the world is going to be amazed at him. He's going to go into the temple and he's going to sit in the temple. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Showing himself that he is God. And that's what our text is talking about here in verse 2 where he is going to sit in the seat of God and it's because his heart is lifted up. And I, I don't know if you realize this, my friend, but the great sin of the devil is pride. The great sin of the devil that caused him to fall was pride. Now, it's, it's connected with covetousness. If you are proud, you think you deserve more than you have. If you're humble, you believe that you have gotten more than you deserve. Good thing. But if you're proud, you think that you have not been uh, awarded, rewarded, honored, or whatever, uh, such as is your due, and that is the devil. The, when the Bible gives uh, the qualifications for a pastor called a bishop in 1 Timothy chapter 3, one of the things it says is that the man of God is not to be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, that's not talking about him losing his salvation. What it's talking about is he's going to be trapped. He's going to fall. He's going to be brought down because that was what brought down Satan was that his heart was lifted up in pride. I want you to follow along with me, those of you who have your Bibles here, and I want to point out a few things to you about Jesus, the Son of Man and Satan, the man of sin. I don't believe he's called the, the man of sin uh, until uh, that he comes as the Antichrist and actually inhabits him at the midway point of the tribulation period. And I will just mention to you real briefly that there's probably some kind of connection between the Antichrist and Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was an unusual character. He wasn't just the one who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas is the only person in the Bible of whom Jesus said that he was a devil. Now you may get mad at somebody and refer to him as a devil. Come on. Y'all remember that Steve Soltzik that used to go to Glenwood Baptist Church years ago? What a devil he was. Okay? Um, we might refer to somebody with disdain that way. But the only person in the Bible who is said to be a devil was Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. Right. You remember Jesus said, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Another interesting thing about Judas Iscariot 
And, and I'm just throwing this out to you. This is not really much of the message. But another thing about Judas Iscariot is he is the only person in the Bible other than the Antichrist who is referred to as the son of perdition. Jesus in his prayer said, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. You know who he's talking about? He was talking about, uh, the, he was talking about Judas Iscariot. He said, none of them is lost but the son of perdition. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Antichrist is referred to as that man of sin, the son, the, not a son, the son of perdition. Do what you want to do with it. I just thought I'd mention those uh, two things to you. And there's an interesting thing in Acts chapter 1 that it looks like that the wording is, is given in such a way to where it looks like that when Judas Iscariot died, read Acts chapter 1 sometime when they got a replacement for Judas. And when Judas Iscariot died, it said that he died that he might go to his own place. Read it sometime in Acts chapter 1. It looks like that it's referring to Judas, but it says that he died that he might go to his own place. Do you folks know that, that hell is not really the place for unsaved people? They do go there. But it, it wasn't made for them. Y'all remember Jesus said, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Judas, looks like in Acts chapter 1, you read it sometime, looks like Judas went to his own place. So it looks like there's some connection there. But in talking to you now about the man of sin, the devil in human form, the Jesus, number one, speaks here in Ezekiel 28 briefly, but speaks of the creation of Satan. Now, Satan has not always been. Jesus always has been. Amen. Jesus always is. Uh, Jesus is eternal. The devil did have a beginning. Amen. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Interesting word there, that, that that king of time, he was created. Look at verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, before I say anything else about the Son of Man and the man of sin, Jesus is the Creator. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, Jesus. And without Him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the Word, Jesus Christ, manifest in verse 14 in the flesh. Uh, the Word, Jesus Christ, made everything. Amen. And that included the devil. So Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God, He is the Creator. Satan was the creation. Satan was created at some time in the past. Another thing that Jesus tells us here in this passage about the man of sin or Satan, he speaks here in verse 14 of what I'm going to call the cherub office. The cherub office of Satan. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now I believe this is a reference to the devil. Be unusual for the king of Tyrus to have been in heaven among the cherubs. Do you know, folks know what that reference is to? About uh, the, it was pictured in the building of the tabernacle and of the uh, temple here on the earth. But what we're talking about is uh, in going in to uh, worship God in the holy of holies. Uh, there was the ark of the covenant. There was the mercy seat there, and there were cherubs that were built that were around there, and their wings stretched out, covering that area, covering the mercy seat. And that matched what we find up in heaven. Uh, there are angelic type of beings, not, not angels, 
but angelic type of beings called cherubim in heaven. You'll read about them in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, Revelation chapter 4, and chapter 5, and see some interesting descriptions of what they look like, but they have wings up there, and it appears that at one time, Satan was one of those cherubim. Verse 13, uh, or verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, this creature, the devil, was a majestic looking creature. Not only was he a majestic looking creature, but he was a musical creature. As a matter of fact, somebody has pointed out that it's very possible that not only did he have musical instruments as part of his apparel, but it looks like that it's very possible that musical instruments were part of his person. Yeah. Yeah. That is part of his body. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now come on, don't, don't get to thinking, you know, just thinking, weird stuff about UFOs and outer space extraterrestrial things and stuff like that. Um, I look at you people and your ears are musical instruments. That's how you tune up. Yeah. Right. Okay? Right. Your nose is a musical instrument. <laughs> your tongue, your vocal cords are musical uh, instruments. That's right. uh, you can't, you can come, even combine all of it and <laughs> You can whistle and hum at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Um, sometime where we can get away with it. We've actually got somebody who's volunteered to do a duet with me sometime in whistling. I don't know that we can get away with that. So we'll have to figure out an appropriate service to try to do something like that. But if you read there in verse 13, and it talks about these precious stones being the cover of the cherub, then notice it says, in verse 13, The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee. The workmanship was prepared in thee. I don't know if that means uh, that for sure, but it's possible that the devil originally, such a musical creature, I'm telling you that one of the devil's realms is music, uh, such a musical creature may have had action, but it, at least his character was music, musical. The devil's realms are primarily realms of worship and education, yeah. but watch out for the realm of music yeah. because the devil gets involved there. Third, Jesus speaks here of the creation of Satan, the chair of office of Satan. Number three, he speaks here in verse 15 of the corruption of Satan. Verse 15, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And I pointed out that iniquity to you from 1 Timothy chapter 3, the condemnation of the devil. If you go to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, and you read about the fall of the devil there, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That's Isaiah 14, verse 12. And if you read through that, verses 12 through 14, five times the Lord said, I'm going to bring you down because thou hast said in thy heart. And he starts out by saying, I will be like, and I will do this, I'm going to do this. Five times he says, I, 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 I. And then the Lord says, yet yeah, you're going to be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. You exalt yourself, my friend, you're going to be brought down. Amen. 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 Let another man praise thee and not thine own lips, a stranger and not thine own mouth. Yeah. Pride goeth before destruction, and the Holy Spirit before a fall. The condemnation of the devil was his pride. Yeah. I jokingly said in Bible Institute, I said, My next book is going to be on the subject of pride. I've already got it worked up, and I think it's going to be one of the best things that's ever been written. <laughs> You're not going to see me write for going to pride. <laughs> There's no way that I, I would try to. It's hard to even preach a sermon on pride. I mean, how, how can a preacher preach a sermon on pride and then, and then go out the door and somebody say, that was a wonderful sermon preacher? Yeah. 
The preacher said, well, I thought so myself. <laughs> but the devil's sin was pride. The corruption of Satan. He was proud. He was presumptuous. And I said, when you're proud, you think that you deserve much more. Honor, prestige, positions, possessions, whatever. You believe that you should have much more than what you had. That was the devil's mindset. And then in verse 16, the fourth thing I want to point out to you is Jesus speaks here in this passage of a casting out of Satan from heaven. Verse 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee out as, a, as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. There was a casting out of Satan from a, a position there sometime in the past. And he had a position as a cherub, an anointed cherub covering the throne of God. At this time, he still has access. He was uh, the anointed cherub. Today, he still has access to the throne. And guess what he does at the throne today? He accuses you. He spends time going across the earth and he goes back to heaven and tells God what you did. And he not only tells God what you did, he's a good reporter for some of these liberal newscast networks. He makes up stuff. And tells that uh, to the Lord. The accuser of the brethren. And there's going to come a time during the tribulation period where he's going to be cast out of being able to even have access to be able to accuse you before the throne of God. That will be a time for you and me to shout, my friend. Yeah. And then one of these days, he's going to be cast into the lake of fire and burned. But we'll say some more about that in a minute. Just realize that the devil is real. Right. And I'm preaching tonight to help you, to help remind you, because we get our mindset so much, if we're not careful, from the stupid hell of vision. Yeah, I said it just how I meant to. Amen. We get so much of our mindset and our thinking, our philosophy from Hollywood yeah. and from the stupid television. Amen. Yes, I've got one. I'm just saying you need to be careful. Amen. If you don't spend time in this book every day, you will be warped yeah. Yeah. in your mind yeah. by the thinking of this world. If you can't figure out what's going on around in this world about you, why in the world are people doing the things that they're doing it's because that their mindset is not one that God has given them. That's right. Their mindset has come from the things that they've heard. Yeah. And many uh, were not just deceived, but they are petrified. They are terrified. People are scared uh, to death out there in this world. But Jesus speaks here in verse 16 about the casting out of uh, Satan from heaven. Jesus speaks here of, uh, further of the conquest of Satan in Eden. And what I'm talking about is the devil had a little victory uh, back in the past uh, described in Genesis chapter 3 where he deceived uh, the woman and the, the man ended up in the sin uh, as well because he chose to sin against God and he, the devil deceived them. Uh, the Bible speaks of it in the New Testament. That, that it says that the man wasn't, being, wasn't deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The Bible says that, that the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, but that deception entered in to the first disobedience by man of God, and they were defiled, they died spiritually, and they were damned, and after Adam and Eve sinned, every person in this world is damned, is condemned, until he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We don't have to, somebody doesn't have to work at it and become bad enough to be lost. A person doesn't have to do enough things that we dislike before we can tell them that they are lost. The Bible says that he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. 
Because, not because he's become a career drunk, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we don't condemn people that are already condemned. Unbelievers are already uh, condemned uh, because uh, the Bible just states that you're born in iniquity, you're born in sin. Those sins are, are accounted to you just as soon as you get the law of conscience and you understand the difference between uh, good and evil. And so you're born into this world going into the wrong direction and you are condemned until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Once you believe on Him, Amen. hallelujah. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. And Jesus speaks here of that time when that happened. Then he speaks here of the claim that Satan will make during the tribulation period. In verse 2, we'll mention it one more time. Because thou hast said, excuse me, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Now for time's sake, and we're going to draw to a close pretty quickly, I'm not going to get you to turn to this passage, but if you want to have an understanding of what this is talking about, you ought to jot down in the margin of your Bible, if you don't have it memorized to know where to turn, you ought to jot down as a very minimum, 2 Thessalonians, and you can do it by just put 2th right there in your, in your margin. 2 Thessalonians 2, colon, verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Listen. So that he as God sitteth, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now folks, in the temple of God and in the tabernacle, there was no place for anybody to sit down. I do not believe that when the temple is rebuilt during the tribulation period, and it'll be a, it'll be a, a lightning fast project, and uh, don't you doubt that the word of God can come through, they can build it immediately and quickly. Right. Warp speed, President Trump would say. <laughs> yeah. They'll build it real, real quickly during the tribulation period. There is, if they build it like it was in the Old Testament, there's no place to sit down. Yeah. Priests did not sit down right. in the temple. They stood. Right. And the reason for that, their work was never done. Right. Jesus, when he did his great work of sacrifice and atonement, went to heaven, went to the throne, and sat down, Amen. having obtained eternal redemption right. for Amen. us. Our great high priest is seated. Yes. So if the Antichrist is going to go into the temple, it's because it's associated with a claim. Because he's going to go into the temple, and he's going to sit down. But there's no chair in the temple. He's going to sit down at the mercy seat. Yeah. Is the only place. place I can think of right. that would be called a seat. And if he sits on the mercy seat, that is where God came down and appeared to the great high priest and talked with him and gave them God's will. Standing where he should not. The Bible speaks of Matthew Day. Sitting where he ought not, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. My friend, during the, during the tribulation, and I'm telling you that I have never, ever had it been made so real to me that there could be strong delusion go across an entire world yeah. like it's happened in the last year and a half. Yeah. Amen. I'm not trying to to push anything on any of you. Yeah. I'm just trying to be honest with you as you're preaching. I'm trying to be honest with you with what I believe and what I have seen when I've gone out there in this world. I have never seen such a spirit of delusion go across an entire world at one time. 
And folks, it just shows me that during the tribulation period, it can happen. It can happen again. Strong delusion. Lastly, I want to say that in verses 17 through 19, Jesus speaks here of the casting down to the ground of Satan. I'm not going to, to read it over again, but he says, I will cast thee to the ground. This will be literally fulfilled at the close of the tribulation period. We call that the battle of Armageddon. The devil will be cast down. He'll be uh, bound in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. He'll be loosed for a little season. There'll be a battle that most of us refer to as the battle of Gog and Magog. And then the devil will be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet will still remain and still be burning after having been cast into that lake of fire 1,000 years earlier. The Antichrist at the Lord's coming at the battle of Armageddon is going to be beaten, he's going to be burned, and he's going to be banished. And from then on, with the exception of the loosing for a little season at the close of the millennial reign, the devil will be in the heart of the earth burning in hell. And then after the millennial reign, he's loose for a little season and he's cast into the lake of fire. You talk about being thrown from the frying pan into the fire. That's what it's going to be like when the devil is punished then. Amen. My friend, Satan is real. Amen. Satan's desire from Isaiah 14 is to be like the Most High. He wants to have that which belongs to God only. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to have the power of God. Satan's device, his main device to get this is to deceive people. To fool them and to trick them into believing that he is God and worshipping him. My friend, as a Christian, you know that the book ends with a guarantee of Satan's doom. Amen. Satan is doomed. Yes. If you've read your Bible, we're on the winning side. Amen. 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 And the the end of the uh, the end of Satan is not a true end because that he will burn forever and ever and ever. But the end of Satan is described in Revelation chapter twenty. But hallelujah. There's Revelation 21 and 22. Amen. And I want to say for the believer, the best is yet to come. Amen. Resist the devil. The Bible says, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I just wanted to give him his due tonight. The Son of Man is the Creator. Amen. And he's able Amen. to have his way Amen. with the devil. Let's stand together. Heads bowed. Don't you let the devil have his way with you.